Uh, my name is uh, Minas Kafados, and uh, I am uh, the Dean of the Schmidt College of Science at uh, Chapman University and uh, also Vice Chancellor. And uh, so pleased to have you all here today. I think more people are coming in. Uh, what um, we're going to have today is uh, uh, a lot of fun. Okay, let's start with the fun part. Uh, we, we, of course, uh, are going to be uh, approaching the issue of energy, economy, and the environment uh, from a variety of viewpoints. Um, and this idea, of course, is not just ours. It's really, I believe, it's the only way that uh, we can tackle a complicated system such as uh, the climate and the in impacts on the economy and the environment. And, um, Energy, of course, being uh, such an important component of everything. Uh, in um, 2009, December 2009, a number of us um, from Chapman, about nine faculty and uh, staff, we attended um, uh, the uh, UN-sponsored uh, climate conference at, um, in Copenhagen, which was uh, an interesting experience for me personally, and I'm sure for the rest of the, for the people who were there. Uh, for example, there were something like uh, 40, 45,000 um, uh, delegates of NGOs and uh, government representatives, uh, but the center over there could only uh, house about 50,000. So you can see immediately the planning and situation was fairly unexpected. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, disappointments. For people trying to get in, uh, we had people flying in and not being able to get in. Uh, they, my understanding is they even turned away the delegate from China, pizza probably from China, which was uh, probably not a good idea, you know, since uh, China is, uh, is producing a, a quarter of uh, the carbon emissions. Uh, but the, really the, the biggest, of course, disappointment is that we, there were no solutions that were reached uh, uh, globally uh, under the auspices of the UN. And, in thinking, going back and thinking a little bit about it, it's um, difficult for something like that to happen. Uh, really, the solutions, I believe, is uh, more or less at the local and regional level, more or less what we have here. You know, it, we have stakeholders which include uh, uh, the academia, national labs such as the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, and of course, uh, last but not least, the business sector, uh, which represents. Uh, investment sector, the energy, uh, the information technology, um, and uh, of course uh, various aspects of the economy. Um, so in thinking as after the what we call Beyond Copenhagen, which was a conference we, we held about a year ago on uh, April uh, three days uh, around Earth Day um, 2010, we decided to repeat the situation of the, this year, but we said, well, let's, this time let's make it more focused. Make, let's really make it more uh, uh, business um, orientation in the sense that we really want this dialogue to take place with the, uh, with the business. Uh, and the Beyond Comrade Hiken Conference was a, a very big success. We had uh, uh, 300 uh, people attended, and uh, international panels, uh, uh, scientists from uh, as far away as uh, Geneva, um, uh, UK, London, um, uh, all parts of you know, Europe, and even Korea. And um, they, uh, we had uh, a good scientist such as a gas master who led, uh, was, who led um, the earth science projects at uh, NASA headquarters. Was, uh, uh, keynote speaker, one of the keynote speakers. So that was uh, more global and looking at the climate system and various issues, but we did bring in the issues about law, policy, and economic components. Uh, but again, this year we really wanted to have a little bit more intimate and shorter meeting because we realize your time is very valuable. Uh, you don't have infinite times time like, uh, like we academics, right? But uh, even we academics are quite busy. So the logical step was to really uh, have a, what we call EQ, which is really the energy, the economy, and the environment. Or maybe it's the environment, the energy, the economy, it doesn't matter, that's why it's EQ. 
anyway you, you write it, it's, it's the same way. So, uh, and before I um, say a couple of words about the uh, uh, first speaker who is um, going to talk a little bit about, to us about the climate uh, science, um, we also at Chapman we have been trying to respond rapidly to uh, events as they unfold on the earth. You know, you would say, well, that's, you know, that people should be doing that. Well, it doesn't happen always in academia, you know. In academia, we, what we do is um, education. That's our primary business. And um, some of the things in education don't change that much. They, so we do, we do need to, in the Schmidt College of Science, um, we need to provide a good science. And, um, um, but at the same time, when you're dealing with uh, these issues of uh, the environment and how it ties to economy and policy and, uh, uh, and of course, the energy, uh, it becomes a little bit uh, more complicated. And um, given the, uh, for example, the recent events that happened in uh, Japan, you know, which uh, is probably a wake-up call for a lot of us um, for a variety of viewpoints, uh, a catastrophic um, uh, hazard that became a disaster, uh, an earthquake 9.0. They don't occur very often, but they, when they do occur, um, they, it's, a, it's a major um, uh, damage, uh, not just to the economy, uh, one particular country, and of course uh, thousands and thousands of dead people and displaced, but to the entire global system, and in fact even the entire Earth. I mean, the whole Earth was just ringing from that earthquake. Um, just to give you perspective, um, um, a 9-point earthquake, um, the, the energy that is not released on the surface, because that would be really, but most of the energy is inside the Earth, is equivalent to 660 million uh, Hiroshima bombs. You know? So this is the kind of energy that was unleashed um, beyond, below the surface of the Earth. And, um, even a small fraction of that, uh, of course, which was the, uh, the surface effects uh, were very, very devastating. And then tsunami, it turns out, was the killer. You know, that was really the, the main thing. And uh, as it was in 2004, a uh, great earthquake of Sumatra. Um, so for us at Chapman, we, uh, Bill Sprague is here. He's one of the panelists. He'll say more, more about it. But we came up with the concept, and we have been talking a little bit to some of the industry people, some of the friends of, uh, of Chapman, uh, this concept of uh, what we call the Chapman Group. And basically, uh, we can come up with another name. But the idea is that you, you have, again, uh, business and uh, academics, uh, primarily, in our case, uh, the science, because we've got to get the science right, and uh, do risk analysis, uh, lessons learned. Um, and in this case, there's a lot of lessons to learn uh, about why systems failed one after the other uh, for a country that is as prepared as, it can be, as any country can be for uh, major earthquakes. But then again, 9.0 is, is a really major earthquake, as you appreciate. They don't come much stronger than that. Uh, maybe another uh, factor of three or 9.2, 9.3, and that's about it. You can't get more um, destructive than that. So um, we invite you all to have a dialogue with us on this concept of Ch Chapman uh, Group. Um, there are, there's a one page, uh, just, uh, it's not even a summary of the white, white paper idea that we already have established, but it gives you the idea of how to respond perhaps rapidly to changing events, and uh, again, Bill will talk a little bit more about it. Without further ado, because we are a little bit behind, our first, um, let me just say a few things. There's, of course, two panels. Uh, there's three panelists and one, um, one moderator in each of the panels, and uh, the first panel is going to be on alternative energy, and then the afternoon, uh, the later of the day, 11.15, uh, is the energy and economy uh, panel. And in between um, those, we have, um, starting first of all with the climate science, uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Graham St Stevens from um, JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who is um, the head of the climate center over there. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the climate uh, physical system, the climate uh, system. And um, of course, our keynote speaker is the Honorable uh, Stephen Johnson, uh, who was the 11th administrator of the EPA. And he will, uh, he will uh, uh, be giving uh, a keynote speech. 
And we have, of course, a lunch at the end and time to us to mix and talk, uh, hopefully. Uh, the, because we have a fairly tight schedule and we want to really get everybody out of here um, by the designated time, uh, we have to pretty much keep um, the uh, time alloc allocated for each panelist, which is 15 minutes. But anyway, the moderators will tell you a little bit more about it. So without further ado, um, Dr. Stevens, can you come up and... Uh... Thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation, and uh, I guess I'll, I suppose I set the stage for this meeting, but I'm not exactly sure. This is the, we're going to talk a little bit about the physical aspects of the climate system. And I guess what are the key message, I suppose, is that energy, climate and energy, and climate and water, and for the physical system, energy and water are synonymous. They, uh, so and when you think about climate change, I know most of you probably think about it in terms of warming, because that's how it's described, right? We expect a warming of a certain number of degrees globally. But fundamentally what it really is about is about changes to the planet's water cycle. And it's a change of the planet's water cycle which sets the pace and the, and the magnitude of the warming. And that's sort of the message, I guess, that, uh, as we go through this talk that you'll hopefully pick up on. Um, so what I want to talk about is, you know, the interconnectedness of water and energy, from, at least from the point of view of the physical climate system, and certainly this water and energy are interconnected in, in other sectors, in the water sector and energy sector. Uh, so warming and moistening, and warming equals moistening, and moistening in turn equals warming. Um, what determines the warming, and hence the moistening? And, and as I said, climate change is really equivalent to a water cycle change connected to an energy change. And why the projections have changed uncertain and what the challenges lie in terms of trying to understand the physical climate system. Now, we don't understand everything. Um, and some of these projections of change are quite uncertain in areas that really matter. Uh, and I'm going to highlight some of, the, some of our challenges. Okay. Well, water and, uh, water, uh, and energy are, in, uh, are interdependent, um, mm -hmm. both from the point of view of the surface world and from the point of view of the physical climate world. They're basically in, in the interconnected in many ways. And these two diagrams at the bottom here show key aspects of our climate system. This is the water cycle. You can think of this as the energy cycle. And I'm going to emphasise to you how these connect together in important ways. So as you change and perturb the energy characteristics of our climate system, it, the response to that change is primarily through the water cycle, which then determines how much change occurs. And you've probably seen diagrams like this, um, you know, the characteristics of water cycle. The water cycle fundamentally is about water rising from the surface into the atmosphere, condensing and falling back to the surface as a cycle. And this cycle roughly, the time scale of this cycle is roughly about 10 days, pro approximately, in terms of how if you took all of the water in the atmosphere and rained it out, it would take about 10 days for it all to rain out at the current rate of rain. Now, um, this is the energy diagram over here, and uh, this is sort of, you've seen any basic climatology book and any basic climate assessment, it'll begin with this diagram. And this is the flow of energy coming in and out of the Earth's climate. You can think of this like the Earth's climate system, this is the mean of the planet Earth. And we actually measure what goes on at the top of the atmosphere with satellites. We can work, we know how much su sunlight's coming in, we know how it varies, we know how much sunlight's leaving the planet, and we know how much other radiation is, uh, which we call long wave radiation or infrared radiation, um, uh, comes out of, the out of the Earth's system, creating a balance. So this, overall, this system's in energy balance. Much, much, goes, much goes out of what comes in. Um, and at the surface, these fluxes of energy at the surface, this is what really matters because this is where the warming occurs and this is where all the action happens and we live on the surface. So the fluxes of energy coming in and out of the surface are actually not measured globally. It's very difficult to measure this globally. We don't have enough measurements of the surface. Of course, you've got huge expanses of oceans which make it difficult. So these are estimated and it turns out that our estimates of these fluxes are actually pretty, pretty crude. Um, so you can see these numbers are like 330 and 300 watts per metre squared, the units of watts per metre squared. The uncertainty is on these flux at the surface about 10 to 20 watts per metre squared. Okay, so why is that relevant? Well, the global warming signature of warming that drives the surface warming is about one watt per metre squared. So we're looking at 
a forcing of the climate system that's one watt and there's no overall uncertainty in terms of the absolute balancing of the flux of the surface, about 10 watts. Now where the water and energy connect is as follows. Um, the, in the, the atmosphere as a whole loses energy. It's always losing energy. And it loses energy primarily through the, what we call the heat trapping gases or greenhouse gases which emit energy out in both directions. So it's losing energy at a, at a rate of about, in the global mean of about 100, approximately 100 watts per metre squared. That's about a third of the energy coming in from the sun. The atmosphere is losing this energy. Um, on the other hand, the surface is gaining energy, largely from the sun, but also from these greenhouse tra trapping gases that heat the surface and maintain the surface. If there weren't these greenhouse gases or heat trapping gases, the Earth's surface would be about 250 degrees uh, Kelvin, or minus 20 degrees centigrade, the Earth's mean surface temperature. So these greenhouse gases play a very important role in sustaining the planet. And so how energy is balanced is heat goes from, heat goes from the surface up into the, up into the atmosphere to maintain a balance. And this heat that goes from the surface up in the atmosphere is primarily what we call latent heating. And what that basically is, is associated with the evaporation of water off the oceans into the atmosphere that condenses into clouds and, and storms and rains out. So this heat transfer is basically directly related to rainfall and precipitation. So that's the connection between water and energy is energy drives the water cycle and the water cycle in turn responds and then shapes the energy. Um, and that's, the, that's, that's what makes Earth Earth. That's what makes Earth climate Earth climate. It also was what makes the climate prediction problem a, a complex problem because we have to deal with how water cycles through the system, how water changes phase from, from, from gaseous to liquid to solar phase, the heat's released in that change of phase and so on. That's fundamentally our climate system. Um, so, what determines a climate system, as I said, is this energy balance of the Earth, um, but it's almost entirely determined by the planet's water cycle. The actual details of the energy balance are almost entirely determined by the planet's water cycle. As you can imagine, you look down on Earth, it's a blue planet, but there's lots of white stuff that's condensed water in the atmosphere to form clouds. Um, um, so and basically what sets our cli climate and what, what sets it today is this, it's got this energy balance occurring at the top of the atmosphere, energy coming in and out of the system. And what climate change is about is a perturbation to this energy balance. The en this, this energy balance gets perturbed in some way through some, what we, what we think of as an external agent that changes the makeup, just also slightly, but changes the makeup of this energy balance. And that can occur a number of ways. Uh, can occur for changes of input from the sun, obviously, or could change in the heat trapping gases uh, or heat, concentration of heat trapping gases. Okay, so that's just two examples of way the climate could get perturbed. Um, um, so the energy, as I said, the energy and water um, define our our climate system, and it's, this is a diagram of sort of talks to the point that um, basically, as we all know, in the, in the sort of the low latitudes and tropical regions, there's more, much more sunlight and more heating comes in the low latitudes and the polar regions are actually regions where energy is lost. So we get energy surplus in one region, energy loss in another region. And basically what that does is that fuels the movement of air from equator to pole, pushing heat equator to pole, and pushing the currents of the oceans, pushing heat equator to pole. So the, the work that's done by the oceans and the atmosphere primarily is to move heat and mix it. So the cold regions get mixed and warmed, in, they get warmed, and the warm regions, heat is taken away from and there's an attempt to try to homogenise temperature. Of course, you'll never homogenise it. You always have warmer temperatures in the equatorial regions and colder temperatures in the poles. This is pretty important, this sort of gradient of temperature from equator to pole, because this is what drives the storms. And one of the issues with climate change is, is the thought that the storms are likely to increase in intensity and more increase in rainfall and so on. I'm going to just touch base on that shortly. But basically, as the a, as a heat gets transported towards the poles, um, heat gets transported towards the poles, uh, it's done through the storms, the weather, like the fronts that we see experiencing in weather, you know, every the daily, the weekly weather. We get warm fronts and cold fronts sweep through. They're really mixing heat at the pole. That's what the action that they're doing. They're mixing up and creating our weather. 
Um, now, in global in warming, what happens is the, the polar regions warm more than the lower lower latitudes, and they warm more in the higher latitudes. We think because the polar regions are covered by snow and ice, and as you warm, that snow and ice and the surface starts to the area starts to shrink, letting more sunlight in, more warming, and accelerates the warming. And so that weakens this gradient in temperature, and it basically suggests that there's less need for these weather storms to transport heat. So you would think that there'd be fewer storms or maybe less intense storms. But the other side of the coin is, as we'll see, as you warm, you get more, more moisture in the atmosphere. More moisture means more condensation and more intense storms. So we've got these competing things going on in terms of trying to understand how, how storms are likely to change in warming, that, we, that we, we still, to this day, don't under, fully understand the details of how these competing forces in climate change are likely to manifest themselves in terms of storm changes. The observational evidence seems to suggest that it's the water part of intensifying the storm, so the storm, storms seem to be intensifying. So water's winning out over the weakening of the gradient from equator pole. Okay, that's kind of... Okay, so let's think about uh, the global warming itself, uh, and there's probably some some of you probably are having your own mind is if we're actually warming or not. And it's, it's basically, the evidence for warming is really unequivocal. Um, it's, and this is just an example of temperature records um, collected and uh, you can take any ver anyone's version of temperature records and reanalyze it and you end up concluding that warming's occurring, this is an example, the last three decades have been warmer than any of the previous decades before. And if you look at just our last decade, or approximately last decade, nine of the 11 years were the hottest years on record. So warming is really happening, and we see the consequence of this all around us. We see one of the consequences is we're observing sea level rising. We're observing the ice sheets losing massive amounts of ice, which exacerbate the sea level rise. Uh, we measure these things. We observe the atmosphere is moistening. Um, this is an example of measurements from satellites measuring the amount of water vapour. And this is just a trend in water vapour. And so where the oceans are warming, over on top of that is where the atmosphere is getting more and more moisture. And more and more moisture fuels the storms and so on. So these, these, these pieces of evidence kind of are all around us that warming is definitely happen, happening. And there's sort of some thought that... Um, and th OK, so this is why we think this... Basically, the whole process works. Um, it's got a little cartoon that, that I put together. So you imagine you have this funny little things down there are, are supposed to be water molecules, hydrogen, uh, uh, two hydrogen, one, ox um, uh, one oxygen. And uh, as, as you warm, as you introduce an agent that perturbs the system, so to speak, like a carbon dioxide molecule adding, emitting, emitting energy to the surface and warming the surface, CO, increasing CO2 increases the surface temperature by a small amount. That in, turn, that in turn enhances the evaporation. That in turn increases the, the warming, increases the water holding capacity of the atmosphere and the evaporation increases the atmospheric moisture. And this is just a diagram that shows how moisture relates to temperature through the clausius clapeyron relationship. And so we could kind of project ex sort of fairly precisely, given one degree of warming, how much water vapour would change in the atmosphere. Water vapour uh, in the atmosphere is the dominant greenhouse gas, way, more, more, way, way stronger in its capability than carbon dioxide. It enhances the greenhouse effect or the, heat trap, heat, the ability to trap heat, infrared radiation in the atmosphere. That in turn enhances the warming. Um, and so the combination of the warming and the moistening leads to more intense or changes in the water cycle. And what we think is going to happen in the water cycle is significant changes to the water cycle um, in a mean sense where uh, the rains are likely to get more intense overall, but there's likely to be fewer, of, fewer heavy rain events. So rains more, overall it's going to rain more, we think, but it's, uh, well, it may well be um, with fewer storms coming through the sun. Uh, and so when you look at the pattern of precipitation, so this is where our view of climate change from a scientific, purely if we be honest, the science community, this is where our ability becomes really quite fuzzy in terms of what we expect. We expect overall, you know, planet as a whole, precipitation will change and increase. We kind of expect the storms to increase in intensity because there's more moisture that kind of fuels those storms. But 
we can't really unequivocally say how the regionally the precipitation patterns shift around. Okay, we can't be absolutely certain because our models, our predictive models that make these predictions, there are there are there remain sort of major issues of uncertainty. So you know, is for example California likely to experience more droughts? And the, the projections are yes, that's the sort of scenario that they're projecting. So this is a pattern of December, January, February, and June, July, August um, precipitation patterns. Uh, the red, the red colours, which don't show up that reddish in this on this, on this screen, the red colours are a deficit of a decrease in precipitation, and the blue colours are increase in precipitation. And these are from the layout, the last series of model projections, and they all tend to show the same thing. Basically, all the different models show the same thing. And there's a kind of a reason we sort of expect, conceptually from a science point of view, why these patterns of precipitation order change. And it has to do with, again, the way heat has to be mixed equator to pole and how this air flows from equator to pole, which we have a fairly good handle on how that works. And associated with that are these shifts in precipitation. Uh, and so what we tend to find, and here's the bottom line, you tend to find regions where there's gaining in precipitation and regions where there's going to be reductions in precipitation. And the, problem, the, the issue of concern for us all really is, if this is a true depiction, is that there are, there are projected to be winners and losers in the precipitation change, uh, climate precipitation change. And basically the winners are those that already get plentiful rains, and the losers are those that are already struggling, uh, you know, or, or where there's really de water deficit and really struggling. So the, so the southwest, for example, are the regions where uh, what we call the subtropical regions, the belt of subtropical regions, like across there, you can see the arid regions of the, of, the, of the northern part of Africa and the Mediterranean. These are regions where we like to get less rain. So these are the dry regions. The dry regions we project to get drier and the wet regions we get project to get wetter. This is mostly what's coming from these predictions. Is, is, can we ag absolutely pin our hat onto this? No, but it's most likely the scenario that, that we ought to expect. Um, and this is an example from the US, from these projections. And, and basically these patterns of change of precipitation of what have we, we've observed, these shifts in precipitation over the last 50 years, and these are the projections into the future, and they look like what we've observed the last 50 years, which sort of gives some credence to it, I suppose. But again, as I said, some aspects of this from the modelling point of view is uncertain. But anyway, the shifts are, as you can see, that the northern part of the, the northern part of the, the northern America is uh, go, going to experience more precipitation than the southern parts. You can see this as a function of season. The southern parts uh, uh, experience less precipitation overall, which is which is the challenge in terms of trying to manage and adapt to climate change, uh, the adaption, the critical, critical adapt adaptivity that we need to kind of be thinking about is adaption to water shifts and changing of water resources. Okay, so what's causing the warming? Um, so there's, 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 a, there's a hope and a wish and a religion that's, that's hoping that it's just merely natural, of course, and the solar is doing it, right? And you've probably kind of seen this discussion about it has to be the sun. Well, it just there's no correlation between the solar activity in the last 25 years and the inc steady increasing in temperature over the last 25 years. There's been a cycle of the sun. This is the kind of the cycling of the sun that's taking place in the last almost 25, 30, 30 years. And basically, the sun output, sun output energy at the top of the atmosphere doesn't. In fact, it's been going down in the last number of years, and well, it's just the temperature is sort of systematically rising. So warming. Warming, not just just looking at patterns and trends like this is one thing, but we just can't simply explain how the tiny changes in the sun's output um, can ch drive the climate change. The, energies, the energy levels of the change are just too small to make sense from a physical climate perspective point of view. So no one's come up with a coherent, <coughs> meaningful mechanism that connects solar activity to, to climate change. So we don't think it's the sun. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, there's basically no one re who really is engaged in the physical, understanding the physical climate system really believes it's the sun. Um, what we do think is the most likely cause, because it's perturbing, it's the largest perturb perturbation in energy balance uh, situation, is this carbon dioxide changing in the greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. And this is a cycle of carbon dioxide over hundreds of thousands of years. This is drawn from ice measurements, ice core measurements. And indeed, carbon dioxide has cycled through the 
through the system as ice ages come and go. But the time scale of the ice age is hundreds of thousands of years. There's tens and forties and fifty thousand years of the cycle. What we're experiencing in the last hundreds plus years is an un absolutely in the historic in the history of Earth an unprecedented rise in CO2. It's unprecedented. There's, there's, there's no doubt about this. Um, and there's no doubt about that this is a heat-trapping gas. There's no doubt that this perturbs the energy balance of the planet. And if you kind of try to work out how much it perturbs and what the cons consequences are, you get, you get consequences uh, that follow that are very similar to what we've observed over the last 20, 30 years. So this is the most likely cause. Scientifically, the simplest explanation is this is the most likely cause for warming. And there's a, there's a real kind of telling fingerprint of this heat trapping gas as being the cause. And this is a temperature profile of our Earth's atmosphere in the mean. And we have a low atmosphere that's low as 10 kilometres roughly, is where all the weather is and where all the storms are. And above that is the, strat the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is a region where the ozone lives, when ozone is a fairly important gas, of course, and it's absorbing UV radiation. Um, the UV radiation that's damaging for, for life and plant life and ecology and so on. So you've got, you got a low atmosphere that's warming and what we find, what, what the theories would tell you about if it's um, heat trapping gases, this lower atmosphere warms, heat trapping gases warm this atmosphere but they actually cool this region of the atmosphere. So you expect to see cooling and warming if it's heat trapping gases. Now if it's sun for example, the sun will heat the whole system just everywhere. So you get warming and warming. And so a kind of a greenhouse gas force warming would have a particular structure to temperature that is exactly what we observe. Uh, the stratosphere, and you can see there's multiple sources of data, different sources of data. You know, one of the things the climate community can come under such scrutiny is they, they, they open and they use different sources of data to hopefully show the same thing. And in the stratosphere case, you know, in this case you see that the stratospheric temperature perturbation in the global mean, stratosphere over the last 45 years is systematically cooling. You get blips in it when you have major volcanic eruptions of stratosphere, but systematically cooling. This map mirrors the systematic warming in the lower atmosphere, and it's exactly the sort of the fingerprint that you expect from greenhouse gases. So, we, we, the scientific community, uh, you know, I, you would find it was at, be at the 95% level. The scientific community thinks the most likely cause of this warming is indeed the build-up of greenhouse gases, trapping extra heat in the atmosphere. Okay. Okay. So the future projections to so roll this up and wind this up, so we can hopefully get back on schedule a little bit. Um, but future projections of climate change are uncertain. So what's going to happen in the future if, as we continue to warm? Uh, it's complicated. Uh, projections are complicated. Projections are complicated for sort of two reasons. One, we don't exactly know what trajectory we ought to be on in terms of growth of CO2. Uh, this is emission levels uh, as business as usual, basically the red curve, and these are different scenarios. And for each, any given scenario, the range of prediction of warming is quite uncertain. Yes, yeah, the grey bar here. So this is the red prediction here. You've got a very large range of prediction. There's, a lot, so there's large uncertainty riding on the uncertainty on the projections themselves. Okay, so these uncertainties that ride upon the uncertainty projections themselves, they fundamentally come about because of the way water interacts with energy and how we represent it in these models. Okay, so what do clouds do? So these clouds reflect lots of solar energy. How are they affected by the tiny particles in which they form? Um, these are sort of some of the major uncertainties that will create this spread. Um, so you can imagine, for example, uh, you know, we got more June gloom here over the 12 months. Over, over 12 months, our the climate, local climate here, would be cooler than it would be if the June gloom would never appear, right? And that's basically what's happening in these models, is the low clouds and the June gloom is more in some models making the models colder and less in other models making them warmer. Okay, so that's sort of what complicates it and, and, and sort of way that to think about it even more, just to add to this sort of view of the interactions that take place that we're trying to represent in these Earth system models. This is actually a picture of a greenhouse. This is actually the greenhousing for a Colorado State University, that's where I used to, uh, I was a professor at Colorado, Colorado State University and my wife was the manager of the greenhouse. So I went in there and took pictures of what the real greenhouse looked like. You know, we you talk about the analogy between climate change and greenhouse. Well, it turns out the analogy 
is actually runs much deeper than I actually realised. So take for example, this is so in the summertime in this greenhouse in Fort Collins, they actually whitewash this greenhouse with whitewash. The reason they do that is is if is without it, you let too much sunlight in and it basically fries the plants in there. So they actually have to whitewash it to, to control the amount of sunlight. And that's exactly the role these clouds play in terms of our climate system. The problem is we the problem is that the greenhouse managers painted it and they knew just how much whitewash to put into the system to regulate that solar exactly. Mother Nature controls the clouds and we have real, real difficulty in trying to anticipate Mother Nature's mood and how it wants to predictably change these clouds and how much whitewash to put into the climate system. The other thing that's really quite amazing was this greenhouse was also air conditioned. It had a humongous big fan at one end and at the other end it has this sort of mulch that sits in a screen that that's, that's water runs through it continuously. So the fans bring in air through, evaporating the water in this mulch and cooling the air as it's flying through. So not only are you regulating the sunlight, you're also sort of air conditioning it with this evaporation. And this is exactly, again, what's happening in the Earth's climate system. We have the massive winds of the weather systems that are moving that heat poleward. They're also picking up the moisture and evaporating moisture from the ocean and cooling the oceans and keeping the oceans from running away and getting warm. They then in turn add the moisture into the atmosphere which then further warms the, warms the system. Um, so the wind and the evaporation of the oceans are also key players in terms of shaping and conditioning the planet's greenhouse effect. So that's sort of what we're trying to integrate uh, when we try to understand the climate system and the physical aspects of climate systems, these are kind of the key elements of it, just like you see in this greenhouse. Um, another aspect of the climate change, or, or trying to understand Earth's climate that's challenging, has to do, as I said, with water. And let's just wrap it up here with the last couple of comments. Um, so water. So when we think about water on the Earth, it's really kind of interesting to think about it in this way. This is a diagram that shows that the total amount of water, for the total amount of water, is only 3% of the Earth's water is fresh. Why does that matter? Well, fresh water is what, what we survive. We survive and that drives our agriculture and we utilise for, for societal and human needs. However, only about one, uh, one third of this fresh water, 1% of the total water, is sort of available for us to use, to drive our agriculture and use. <coughs> The rest of it's tied up in ice sheets and glaciers that really is inaccessible to us. 30% um, of it's in groundwater that we're pulling water out of the ground at unsustainable rates and we're able to measure this now from space by exquisite measurements of gra gravity from space. We measure the fluctuations in gravity as a satellite, just two satellites fly over and those fluctuations in gravity are a direct measure of how much water mass is below it. So we can see the change in that water mass. We can see water being pulled out of the California region. We can see massive changes in water being pulled out of India. Um, but one, only, only, um, only sort of 0.1% um, of the fresh water itself is in the atmosphere. So a tiny fraction of the total fresh water is in the atmosphere. And that's the fresh water that produces the precipitation that replenishes what we use. And so to understand how water resources are going to change in the climate system, we're really dealing with a kind of a minute part of the whole water budget itself. And that's really part of the challenge too. Okay, so that's the key message um, uh, as, a, as you wind up. Uh, increasingly, we have increasingly robust observational evidence of warming world and changing climate. I didn't really show many of that, many of these. I uh, just showed you some examples of global warming, but we have have all sorts of evidence now appearing um, that tells us warming is real. The magnitude and regional manifestations of the warming, however uncertain, we, have, we as a science community have a lot, lot, lot of work to do in order to really be able to tighten down what's likely to happen at the regional scale, which is where it matters for like, policy and so on. A warming world is a wetter world and a warming really ought to be thought about as changing water cycle. And we are confident of certain average outcomes of, of the climate system, but there are some, still some challenges. So here's a couple of challenges. Um, there is still a lot we don't know about, about the system. Um, we keep adding carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but amazingly, um, the atmosphere is not increasing its amount of carbon dioxide at the rate that we're putting it in. And we frankly don't know where all the carbon is going. We just don't know. There is so-called missing sink of carbon, uh, that we, when we do our inventory, we can't figure out, and it's, and it's not a small amount, it's a big chunk, 
of the, so we've got real challenge in carbon. We can predict on average weather will become more extreme. That's on average. But that doesn't help us, you know, when we live in California. Is it, what's the weather going to be like in California? We don't know really enough to determine the regional aspects of such weather extremes, although we are seeing sh regional weather extremes that are kind of consistent with the average view. Um, but we don't really know uh, enough to be really quantitative about the impacts and how to adapt to these changes. And while we're adding carbon to the atmosphere, uh, while carbon adding, adding carbon to the atmosphere heats the planet on average, this is unequivocal, you know, you keep adding carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it'll heat the planet on average. And at high latitude, it heats proportionally more than low latitudes. This is fairly, fairly well established. We don't yet fully know how much heating to expect, and we don't understand the actions of clouds and aerosol wall cards that define how much heating to expect. So we, we, we know heating's going to occur. We can't tell you if it's going to be 2 degrees or 4 degrees out in 2050 or, 20, or, 20, or 2100 uh, because of these uncertain aspects that relate to the water cycle. And the final view graph is in the next 20 to 30 years, this is sort of uh, so our challenges now to adapt to climate change. In the next 20 to 30 years, we're already committed to a certain level of climate change because the CO2 that's, that's, that's been added to the atmosphere in the last 10 to 20, 30 years, the warming of that is just now starting to happen because it, it's delayed by the fact that you have this oceans that are sluggish in terms of releasing their heat. Um, and so that warming is still coming. So no matter what we do to, to the emission level, um, that warming is going to, come, going to take place. How will the incidence and characteristics of hazardous weather that change? This is a good question. Um, uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen massive floods this, last, this, last, this year, in fact, uh, Australia and Pakistan. Uh, we've seen drought, regions of major drought. Um, these are what we expect in climate change. Um, and how is this, the instance of these likely to occur? Um, and will natural climate vari how will natural climate variability, which is part of the whole system, how will that change and interact with this systematic climate change? And um, what does it mean for us as a society and for the natural environment? So these are our challenges ahead. And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you. I know you, you have to keep time, right? Yeah. Yeah, Bill. Graham, my, my impression is that uh, climate research is sort of moving ahead on many, many fronts. Yeah. Is there any part of that that you think might be like a, a game winning play, something that will take uh, uh, really the, the science and the understanding <clears throat> a major step forward? Is yeah. It's not yeah it's mo yeah models are important uh, improving developing models yeah to some extent computing resources are fairly important because the key things that make like making rain and predicting where rain occurs we don't, the physics in the models is pretty crude and not resolved actually it's pretty crude way it's represented so having Better models is one area, but more computational resources in order to drive those models is kind of what would be needed to make them more realistic and make regional projections much more realistic. So significant improvement in towards the direction of modelling and modelling capability and resolution of models. So, for example, the client models that you see in assessments that you report in assessment make these projections of precipitation, their resolutions of the order of 100 kilometres or 200 kilometres. Now, thunderstorms don't exist, you know, thunderstorms and, thunder, and intense rain is on a small scale. So that, that's, they're not resolved in those models. Yeah, that's a very important mode of precipitation, particularly in the US in the summer. So that's not resolved, so it's treated in a proxy way. So until you get to really properly resolve those thunderstorms in models, for example, you're going to have trouble. So better models, more co computing capabilities. More, you know, the water cycle is fundamental, as I, I kind of emphasised, but would you believe that our Earth observational programs worldwide, not just NASA, but worldwide, to observe planet Earth doesn't have a coherent plan to observe the water cycle in the detail we need? There's no current plan. Measuring precipitation is not an operational thing. It's just done ad hoc through some research programs. Yet it's the most fundamental aspect of cl climate change for our society. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, to bring a focus on what really matters in terms of climate change and measurement of climate change is something we ought to be pushing for as a community. 
and not measuring things that you know are are a favourite of certain groups. Uh, you, for example, this is a bit of a hobby horse, but for example, um, measuring the output of the sun is important. You know, it is important in the long term, but it is not the critical issue for climate change. Is measuring how much sunlight sunlight's coming to Earth because we know how much it varies, and it varies very little. It doesn't drive climate change. So why should that be the one of the number one priorities from climate change measurements? Well, it is. So there's an example. Why we ought to be looking at water cycle changes and making having a coherent plan to measure what matters in the relates to the water cycle. That's just, so we could change our priorities, revisit what our priorities really are in terms of observing or Earth. Revisit our priorities in terms of modelling. But you know, the modelling community know that we need better capability and better resolution. And then we need to tie the obs and the models together in a more coherent way. So that's kind of, that's kind of a, a hobby horse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, the water ones. Yeah, yeah, um, but this, I don't know whether I can, I can't, I'm not sure I can do this because this is not mine. Oh, okay. Can we go back to the bar chart? It was, it was about the third or fourth chart, I think. Yeah, I've got to get that guy up there to do it. Because what I see here is someone else's presentation. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, let's just talk the way through it. You said that the temperature has risen rather dramatically in the last three decades. Yeah. So if you look back to the first three decades of the century, yeah. the slope of that curve was of temperature rise. But, almost the same as it has been in the last three decades. Yeah. But these first three decades, they come in sort of a second. Yeah. This next one here. Next one. That one. Oh, this one here? This one here, yeah. If you look at the decade from yeah. 1910 yeah. to 1940 yeah, so or so, that slope is almost exactly yeah. the same as the, as the last three decades. Yeah. And this was at a time when we were doing almost no you sure? The Model T, the Model T Ford was, wasn't even discovered. Until yeah, well, it's not, but it's not just cars, though. And I think we're probably putting as much as five or ten times as yeah. much yeah. greenhouse gases yeah. in the last three decades so, as we did in the first three decades. So I'm really trying to understand. Yeah, okay. So this. Yeah, so here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's always the issue. Um, there, are, there are natural cycles, and, you know, it's. It's a tendency to explain all this as natural cycles, right? Uh, there are natural cycles, natural modes of variability of the climate system that are multi-decadal in, in length. You know, they can, they're 10 to 20 years in length. You can kind of see like an oscillation there in this data, right? So you have natural fluctuations of the climate system that's pulsing on tens of 20s of years. But on top of that, we have this systematic rise that, that we know must be there because the physics tells it has to be there. And so the question is, at what point are we seeing that systematic rise beyond that natural variability? And I think that well, the science community now believes that, that we are now, this is, not, this is not a natural cycle that's going to keep going down. And the reason we say that is that we can kind of put into these models, and they are flawed. You know, I'm not going to not, not tie you back to the models entirely, but you, we can put into our best estimate of how the aerosol change, the volcanic, volcanic eruptions change. They, they fluctuate and make blips in this record too when you have major volcanic eruptions which did occur um, which did occur in these regions in here um, but okay so so when you put the best known f elements of change into these models they can actually reproduce this temperature growth like that which gives us some sort of idea that um, we can dissect them to, uh, to, to determine what's the cause and what's the effect in terms of the warming so yeah, I mean, yeah, you can say, well, this little part there looks like that part there, and, and this, but we never got a cooling in this in the middle region, middle part of this century. And this is part of the natural cyclic, cyc cyc cyclic variation of the climate system. But there's undeniable that this systematic rise in greenhouse gases. If you plot the greenhouse gases, it's just systematically rising through this period. And uh, what we think we're beginning to see is a signal of that well above this cyclic noise that goes on in the system. I'd like to thank our speaker. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to invite the first panel to come up and uh, our moderator. Thank you. While they're gathering, uh, I wanted to give a plug for uh, some of our uh, degree programs at Chapman. We do have um, environmental science um, undergraduate program and um, also we started a master's in uh, basically uh, the climate system or the global change and uh, observations and, um, um, and uh, modeling. 
And there you can find this literature outside. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, very interesting that um, our speaker from JPL uh, zero in on the regional aspects that are very, very important. In fact, we just um, were awarded a Chapman, a major grant from the Na National Science Foundation and the USDA to look at the regional impacts of climate change on agriculture, primary agriculture in California. And this is, of course, agriculture, as you know, it's the, it's the biggest, um, um, California is the biggest agriculture producing uh, state in the nation, and any, any threat to the agriculture system in California would have a major implications, not just for the, for the food supply of the U.S., but also for the economy. Without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to our moderator, Panos, and uh, he will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Good morning from us also. My name is uh, Panos Meletakos. I come from Athens, Greece, a long way from here. Um, we are uh, the actual the alternative energy panel here. And um, we start the presentations, which will be 15 minutes duration. And hopefully at the end of all three presentations, we, we should be able to have the time for question and answer period. I would like to call Mr. Steve Bray now on the stand. Uh, he's the CEO of the Power Plus company to give us his presentation. So um, I'm going to give you, I, I want to start with an example. I'm, I'm into the energy from the standpoint of electric generation and distribution and all of those types of things. Um, but mine's, you know, much more of, of a practical and economic view uh, of how we solve the problem of, you know, greenhouse gases and energy and, uh, you know, all of those, those types of things. Um, and one of the, you know one of the key elements um, is that in there's a there's a good book you might want to read the false promise of green energy um, because what that what that book talks about a lot is we target the wrong things from a practical standpoint we we make assumptions so I'm gonna give you I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the, uh, the this um, this analogy that he uses in the book which is about a car ride from Cincinnati to, um, to Cleveland, or Cleveland to Cincinnati, and the comparison um, that's made. And if I was to pull you on the way in here and say, which is the best method of transportation or mass transportation, uh, you would probably have said, you know, uh, uh, trains are the best. And the way this survey comes out um, in the research uh, and, the, and the least amount of em emissions, buses actually are the best methodology of transportation, assuming that you have a full bus and a full plane and a full train. Um, the, what's interesting about, about this for me was as I read through this, I said, you know, we've been demonizing all the wrong things. And, and the, the green culture is you know, full, just fraught with, oh, this is bad and this is good, but they don't take any type of a scientific view of what is right or w what is wrong to, you know, to, to, uh, to pursue. One of the, I think we'll get there a lot faster if we pick the right things and do that scientifically. Uh, um, so the, the issue for me is, you know, what, what is the truth about where we spend our money, our time, and our, our energy? And we can solve problems. And I'll go back to, um, I grew up here in Southern California. Uh, through, I was born here um, and grew, grew up when I was 15 years old. Uh, we had things called smog alerts. And we had, um, we had horrible smog in L.A. And I, uh, two years ago, I had this epiphany. I was asked to run a race in Los Angeles, and it was called a stair race, and you run up the tallest building as fast as you possibly can. I got to the, I got to the top of the Aeon building, and I saw something that I had never seen before from a panoramic view, because I hadn't been in LA for a long time, um, but I saw all the way around the whole city. Now, when I was growing up, you could not see those buildings, and yet we applied the right methodology for in science and, and data to cure that problem. Now, you would think by all, you know, all, you know, all the natural data that you would, you would accumulate that cars are the problem. But 
you know, and, and we, you know, when I was growing up, my favorite bumper sticker, you know, kind of in that hippie uh, era was schmuck fog because everybody was mad about the, uh, about, you know, the pollution that was in the air. But what we did was we began to do, you know, careful consideration of fuels and, and cars and emissions and things like that. And we're really on the right track. And I believe that um, we're on the right track. I think that we'll spend a lot of money on the wrong track if we go down the, go down the road of, of mass transit. And, some, and here's, the, here's, here's what happens if you go to the second chart. Here's what happens when you put four riders in a car. The most economic value you can get is by driving in a car. Now, you come in second on the CO2 emissions, but cars aren't that bad. You know, car, cars aren't the demons. And during the, the 60s and 70s, we, to, up to now, we've added three times the amount of cars that we've had on the road. So if we focus our energy um, in, in terms of where we spend our money, and, and one of the problems with industry is that we get regulated and we, we're sort of told where to spend our time and our money and our energy. And on, on, you know, on fixing problems. And some of that data is not correct. And, and what's been uh, fun about working with Chapman is that they're trying to bring the sciences together with, you know, sort of the practical hacks like me that go out there and just, are, I'm trying to make a living off of, you know, not only doing the right thing, but applying uh, proper, proper uh, technology. Uh, I want to make one quick analogy. When uh, the first hand calculator came out, it was 400 bucks, okay? I bought one the other day for 50 cents, okay? How did that happen? How did we make such a leap in terms of cost and efficiency and, and you know, small, you know, small uh, categories of those things? We, it's because the free market, no one dictated to you know, the calculator makers, you've got to make them this size, this range, this, you know, they, they can't pollute, the, all these things. Let the free market have a little more say in terms of what, it, in, in terms of what um, happens. And it, it sort of runs its own course. Now, we've got, you know, a lot of subsidies. And um, I always preach to our, all our guys, you know, in, in the sales department, don't look for you know, the subsidies in, in alternative energy, that's not a way to build a business. Now, a subsidy, I'm going to give you an example, and you, I, I hope you hate me for this um, at the end of it. I have a building in, in, in Anaheim. I, um, when I got into the building, we did an, a light evaluation, and we went out, we looked for better lighting, and we found that there was a subsidy that would pay us the, uh, to change that lighting. And the, the, the savings to me on my electric bill was 6,500 bucks a month, okay? So at the end of, uh, so I get the subsidy, I put the lights in, and now I've got this, the, now I've got this great, I'm saving energy, and, and by the way, the system doesn't care whether you save a kilowatt or you generate a kilowatt, it, you know, efficiently. In fact, it's better if you save a kilowatt. So for me, conservation is one of the biggest areas that we need to work on in terms of uh, as, a, as a whole country, as a, as, as a world, how can we conserve energy? Energy demands are going to continue to go up. But so I get this $6,500 in this subsidy, and guess what? I say, thank you. I, got, I had to put a certain amount of capital into it, and I got my capital returned in three months. Okay, So the capital that I put put in. Now the difference between a subsidy and an investment, the United States needs to make investments in green energy. And if it makes, because it's got the biggest bankroll to be able to do that and the biggest latitude to be able to help people do it, they'll run out of subsidies. But if they made that, that made it uh, into an investment, guess what? If the government came to me and said, I want to subsidize you changing all your lights out because I want you to you know, be more efficient. And at the end of a year or 18 months, I was to receive um, that, that savings. I would have said, yes, I'll do that in a heartbeat. Okay, so basically what happened in this subsidy is you guys paid for me to, to, to make money. And 
And so then I want to thank you. And except for you, you're from Greece and you didn't contribute. You need to pony up some money here. <laughs> the, the point is, is that w part of the problem and, and even for, you know, where we spend the, mon the right money on doing the right research, it's a big problem throughout the whole system because it's very political. And, and you know, we, we feel better if we hand out money as opposed to lend money and expect a, a repayment from it. Somehow we've, we've sort of missed that economic boat there. So um, w I'm, I'm really big into distributed generation. I believe that the way forward is where instead of building large plants in which we distribute electricity through, over wires and send it, um, and by the way, my prediction is the death of, of all new, new nuclear plants uh, just happened as a result of the Japanese earthquake because people are not going to want that in their backyard. They're going to say, isn't there another way? And it's going to force. And actually, I like, um, as I rank it, I like nuclear energy better than I like coal. Okay, and 50% of the United States is on coal, coal fire, coal fired plants. So the, for me, the bottom line is, is that um, what, what we need to focus on is uh, let the ec economics speak for themselves. Um, if I t tell you that um, you're going to save X, Y, Z dollars by turning off lights and you'll, you'll save CO2 emissions, you, you, know, you might make a change in terms, of, in terms of your patterns and your habits. And it needs to be saving the planet and saving money at the same time because that's what gets people's attention. In, in terms of how we you know, go forward in this, in this process. There's more research money. We can solve a problem. We solved the smog pop problem, you know, lickety split. It didn't take a long time. I would have never expected, and I knew people that were moving out of LA because of the smog, I would have never expected when I was 15 years old to go drive through LA and see all those buildings because I had never seen them before from you know the drive through it was a it was a great thing when you could see the Hollywood Hill sign okay as you drove through to go to northern california so if we will you know take that you know take that approach and now this distributed generation model means that you make your power where you're using it as close to where you're using that power you make that power we do that with cold air we don't have a central cold air plant, we ship it in, you know, all, all around Southern California in, in big, you know, white pipes. And it, we, we don't do that because it's not practical, nor is it practical to m use the antiquated system that we have currently right now for generating electricity and making, uh, and, and, and using energy to make electricity. We transport it around, we lose uh, what 60% of it at, you know from the from the time you start with it to the time that you you um, uh, distribute it, it it's a it's a poor use of our resources and so that's you know my two things if I leave you know three things think about this the cars are not the demons okay and actually we can probably get so much better and and in this uh, in this uh, uh, you, you are assuming that a car gets 22 miles per, per gallon. Look at the economics and the CO2 em emissions, how they go down if we had cars that got 50 miles to the gallon or 100 miles to the gallon. You see, cars are not the problem. I think what we should focus on um, are, are, are big things that we can make changes on. And, and one of them is, is, you know, really just conservation. Um, my kids, you know, grew up with me, you know, yelling and screaming at him about turn off the lights when you leave the room. And, um, and it's a simple methodology. Every time you stop using something, just, you know, turn it off. You go to a hotel room, you know. Why is it, you know, that we go to a hotel room and we leave all the lights and the TV and everything running and, you know, we get 14 more towels and do it. See, w there's some real simple practical things that we can do as uh, human beings to, um, to help this process along. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, 
I would like to call now uh, Bill to speak from the Smith College of Science, Chapman University on the stand. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And, and uh, Steve, that was a very interesting talk. It's a nice segue into some of the things that I wanted to discuss as well. Uh, the reason this panel has even been formed, I think, is because the system is broke and we're all looking for some, some way of solving this. So we're going to discuss that a little bit today. And I'd like to talk a little bit about energy alternatives. There are a million of them out there. Everybody has uh, a nice idea of how they can um, generate more power, more electricity, uh, and, and it can be renewable, can have a lot of other advantages. But as, as Steve was pointing out, many of these, we just don't investigate enough. We don't look into them in sufficient detail to understand what all of the ramifications might be uh, if we actually accepted some of these. I'm not going to go into details here, but for example, in the, in the wind uh, generating idea there, uh, one, one idea is to sort of create a perpetual tornado and, and we can uh, uh, capture energy from, that, from the tornadic winds. Um, in the uh, solar area, there are uh, ideas that you can put thousands of uh, square kilometers of floating islands in the oceans or, or in the seas and capture solar energy and do something with it. Um, Steve, while you, were, while you were talking, I was thinking maybe uh, bringing energy closer and closer to where you need it is, is a good idea. And now I, I'd like to add one up there, maybe uh, taking all of the, the uh, treadmills, stair steppers, and, <laughs> and everything in, in Gold's gym and powering the whole gym. You know? so, uh, or maybe the neighborhood, I, I don't know. But uh, there, there are many, many ideas, but they all have to be studied. They all have to be looked, put into context as to what they produce. And, and your illustration of the automobile, uh, first glance, kick that out and, and, uh, and, and create some other kind of transportation is, is one example. But they, even that has to be looked into because I'd have a few uh, uh, things to challenge you on, on, on that one as well. <laughs> but when we are considering these different uh, methods of energy generation, maybe we should look at uh, several different points. See how they stack up with sustainability. Is that fuel always going to be there? Will it be there for the length of time that we think we need it? What about the materials that the, that the uh, uh, generator is made of? How is it encroaching into, uh, uh, into other economic sectors or, or our property or uh, affecting uh, uh, the uh, uh, ability to, to raise crops, for example? the scalability of something like this. Will it produce as much energy as we think that it will? And is it worth constructing in order to produce that energy? The efficiency, the renewable resource, is it really, truly renewable? Uh, these things have to be examined. We, we just heard earlier from, from uh, Graham Stevens about uh, the imbalance of the water cycle in some instances, in regional, you know, the regionality of it. Can we really depend on uh, hydropower under conditions of climate variability or climate change? The adaptability or resiliency to a changing economy or changing technology, new uh, new, new advances in, in uh, energy generation that might suddenly step in and uh, take over what someone has constructed for multi-millions of dollars. Is it, uh, would it be eventually a threat to the environment? Will it be a threat or a benefit to the local economy and to recreation? I mean, these are all points 
that we have to consider in, in testing one, uh, one method after another. Now, one idea that, that uh, I'm particularly interested in now, I mean, I'm not an engineer, I'm in environmental science, but it seems to me that capturing the ocean's energy is one of those ideas that we should look at. But there are some uh, interesting problems. Uh, I, I uh, have been talking with David Rose, a, a, a local businessman, who's quite interested in pushing this idea, pushing this technology. And, and so I would like to examine this with him. Uh, let's, let's see if this is appropriate or can it really be done for along California's coast. Well, there are some issues that come up. I'm only listing a few of them here. But um, ocean currents, one of the, one of the drivers of, of uh, perhaps an, an ocean turbine, um, they're kind of slow here along the Pacific coast compared to other places. And most of the existing technology will handle the, uh, the uh, faster current, but not the real small one. New England projects, and, and there is at least one underway, um, required an awful expensive mooring capability, so much so that uh, it, you know, they, they wonder if this is really going to work on the New England coast. Santa Catalina Island at one point was uh, thinking of, of a, a transmission of, of uh, power lines across the island and that became a, a, a problem, a, an eyesore, my guess is, and probably other factors involved. Anyway, you have to worry about some of the legal issues of uh, any type of new technology, such as this ocean current system. Um, David Rose tells me that uh, the California Energy Commission and the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, um, has uh, set up a very rigid uh, criteria that need to be met in order for you to set up any kind of uh, system uh, for energy generation. Those same New England projects uh, needed uh, $17 million per megawatt to install and uh, again, uh, kind of outweighing a little bit of the profitability of, of that system as it exists today. And uh, Pacific Gas and Electric uh, for Northern California uh, project was abandoned at one point because of excessive costs. Now some of these things you need to revisit after you've determined something like this. Maybe someone has come along and, and developed new technology. So it's, a, it's not a static issue with some of this. For example, I know that in the first point up there, there have been some advances made that will allow uh, that ocean current technology to be used in low current uh, speeds. But there are quite a few incentives for moving ahead. To me, uh, the, the main one is that our current uh, uh, dependence on oil and gas uh, is not going to last for too long. And uh, there is a considerable amount of pressure to try to wean us from that. And everyone in this room, of course, has, has understood that. California has something like 900 nautical miles of coastline. And there's a moon up there, and it's been up there for a long time. And, uh, and it'll continue to be there, at least that's my forecast and you get uh, continuing tides all of the time, incessant, always pounding the coast, coming in with energy that should be tapped. In Europe, there are at least a couple of pilot projects doing very well. Uh, there are major investments being made in Australia, Canada, China, India, Israel, Japan, a number of countries to look into wave generation uh, uh, power and uh, and and uh, uh, coastal energy. One estimate is that the cost 
uh, for installing one of these devices operating it on the California coast is uh, similar to that for wind power. And uh, Steve, here is your incentive right here for um, uh, building something like this, uh, tax incentives and grants and so on, trying to push this technology at least into testing it. Uh, evidently, there's quite a bit of money that may be available to, to um, try it. So why don't we do something? I mean, uh, my, my uh, uh, nature is that when I see a problem, and I think that I've got some ideas to solve it, and I know that I have some tools that can help, I want to move ahead and, and do something. So uh, someone should uh, develop some kind of a plan and a strategy, perhaps, to explore this idea, see if it is feasible to construct something along the California coast, test it out. And one of the uh, tools uh, that, uh, that we have is that of uh, wave modeling uh, and uh, uh, coastal weather forecasting, an ability to examine, first of all, the environment in which one might want to place a, 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 a coastal energy generator, uh, ways of examining the environmental impacts continuously, and the operation of the system itself. So here at uh, Chapman, we have uh, satellite downlinking uh, capability to observe the ocean surface, to observe the character of the environment. Um, we can see, let me see, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this. The, the um, uh, area of the model, the grid uh, that the model operates on extends all the way across the northern Pacific. Uh, there, depicted here are three different scales of detail that can be derived from these models, one nested in the other, to give you greater and greater resolution and specificity about the character of the ocean and, uh, and the meteorology. Uh, here is a, a web page for an operational weather uh, prediction system at uh, Schmidt College. A couple of examples, uh, perhaps uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, satellite observing system looking at the ocean's sea surface temperature is uh, one of the variables that, that will help us uh, understand the environmental impacts or to predict or anticipate where to locate certain uh, systems. The type of uh, wind uh, forecasts along the California coast are getting more and more detailed. Graham mentioned earlier about cloud resolving models. We actually have those for small areas for weather. Uh, being able to incorporate them into the into the climate scale is, is uh, another matter and, and one of the areas of, of research in, in the university. This is a larger picture of that one that I showed you before. And not only would the uh, wave modeling uh, capabilities address the power situation, but there are a number of other uh, products uh, wave height, the direction, maximum expected wave height, swell heights and directions, mean and peak wave period. And <clears throat> these are being used uh, in, in a number of different applications. So there is something that I feel we can do and, and can do it now and that is to begin that uh, process of examining the, the system that uh, this um, ha ha has, has been proposed for the uh, uh, ocean wave generation along the California coast. There are already some ideas about exactly where these should be placed and, and uh, what they should be consisted of, uh, but there is uh, a need to really study 
what the implications are and uh, if there are any trade-offs or, or uh, uh, game breakers that uh, should not take this on any further. Uh, Dean Kavatos mentioned the Chapman Group. This could be, for example, one of the undertakings of, of such a group. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bill, for the very interesting presentation on New Frontiers for Energy Production. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Mark uh, Ulrich. He's the Vice President of Renewable and Alternative Power Department of Southern California Edison. Uh, Mark, you can take this time. Yes. Thanks. Do you guys remember being a kid and going to your first movie and you thought, you know what, I'm going to sit as close to the screen as possible <laughs> and right in the middle. Being on this panel is really stretching that and taking it to a whole new level. I've had a tough <laughs> time watching the slides without hurting my neck. So I'm going to be sore, but I do appreciate you guys inviting me to, to speak with such and be around such intelligent people. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is uh, be brief because we're behind, um, but <clears throat> also uh, provide as much information as I can. Um, one of the things I'm going to run through just in a, in a hurry is uh, what of our portfolio looks like. And we, there was a mention about um, uh, solutions for the smog uh, in the L.A. basin area. I'm happy to report on the portfolio for renewable energies growing all the time, and I think it's a fantastic. Um, the other thing we want to talk about is uh, policy and renewable and alternative power. It's changing. Uh, we just got a new law in the state of California on uh, uh, April 12th, so we'll talk briefly about that. What's the fleet going to look like in 2020? Um, and how is the grid going to be affected and what challenges are there? So how am I going to do this in 15 minutes? I don't know, <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot. So let me ask real quick, I'm going to give you five choices. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand because I really don't have a sense of uh, what people's uh, perception is of uh, renewable portfolios. But I'm going to give you five uh, uh, renewable types, and I'm going to ask you guys to tell me uh, which one do you think uh, is the biggest in our portfolio. So let me give them to you first, and then I'll ask individually. So we have um, solar power. We have hydro, small hydropower. We have wind. We have geothermal. Um, and biomass. And these are pieces of our portfolio. Who thinks um, biomass is the biggest piece of the portfolio? Okay, how about uh, wind? Solar? Geothermal? Did I miss any? Small hydro? Okay, so this is, was surprising to me too when I took the job. Geothermal is 53% of our renewable energy. Not only is it 53% of our renewable energy, it's 53% of um, the renewable energy that we deliver, but we deliver more renewable energy than any other company in the United States. In fact, Edison by itself uh, delivers more renewable energy than 48 out of 50 states. It's, we have a long, long ways to go to really get penetration, but California is leading the way, and it has been for a while. But one of the questions is, where does energy efficiency stand, and where do we reduce the use before we actually supply the generation? And that's a good, uh, good question, a good focus. If you look at the charts for energy use per person in California from 1950 to 2010, what you'll see is a pretty steady growth, and you can look at, there's a chart, you can look at steady growth between the U.S. energy use per person and the California energy use per person. And as they were going right in the 70s, they were following each other, and then about 1970 when Governor Moon, Moonbeam came in, <laughs> the California usage stayed flat, and it's been flat for about three decades now. But the United States usage has continued to climb. So that's something that Californians should be proud of. Um, but it, it also means we have work to do elsewhere. Uh, so geothermal is the biggest piece. Uh, solar is the fastest growing piece, but it's the smallest right now. Um, and the question, I get questions all the time. Uh, for us to meet the state goals, is it going to be large scale utility where we have to 
uh, build this way out uh, remotely and transmit the wire in, or is it going to be small distributed generation uh, located very near to the usage? My answer to the, that question is yes. Uh, you, this is not a silver bullet, it's a uh, thousand silver BBs. Um, so this is, uh, the goals in California were to 20% of our uh, energy should come from renewable resources in 2010. The goal is going to 33%, um, sorry, I hit a button and I didn't mean to, 33% um, by 2020. That's not a 13% increase, by the way. Going from 20 to 33 is a 89% increase in the amount of renewables. So I have to almost double the amount of renewables I had in 2010. It's quite a bit. Um, we delivered in, in 2010, 19.4% um, of our energy was renewable energy. Um, so we're just, just shy of the 20% goal, but we met that because uh, the goal, because in prior years, we had exceeded the goal. And so uh, the, the good news about uh, the rules is there's banking and borrowing. So uh, even though you might have 33% in your portfolio, the wind doesn't always blow exactly the same every year. The sun doesn't always shine. Sometimes it's 31%, sometimes it's 35%. So it fluctuates. So the, the rules are established so that we can use excess in one year towards uh, shortfalls in other years. And it, it should be established that way. Um, so if you want to know about uh, renewable portfolio standards across the United States, there's a great website. I'm sorry, uh, Chapman, I'm plugging NC State right now. Um, <laughs> NC State has uh, this website called DesireUSA.org. Uh, I think it's on here somewhere, uh, right at the top in the middle. And it, you can go very quickly and look at all the incentives for energy efficiency, all the incentives for renewables. What are the renewable energy targets? Some of them are uh, thermal. Uh, targets. Some of them have solar carve-outs, um, but they're all over the all over the United States. The white states don't have any either renewable energy standard or portfolio standard. California has the most, my opinion, the most aggressive uh, standard uh, today, and that's okay. So what are the rules? I said the rule was 20% by 2020. Just uh, of about a week ago or so, uh, Governor Moonbeam, who I'm now um, uh, coining uh, Governor Sunbeam, uh, signed a new law to take us to 33% uh, by 2020. Um, this debate has been going on for about four years to get to 33%. What are the rules around it? How do we get there? Um, and in 2009, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger actually vetoed a bill that was going to take us to 33%. And Southern California Edison supported that veto. And the reason is we, we support getting to 33%, but you got to get the rules right. You got to be able to, if you're going to ask me to fix a car, you got to give me a set of tools to be able to fix that car. And the bills two, three years ago, th they had these requirements and I had no tools to be able to get them done. Um, so he vetoed the bill and started a renewable electricity standard uh, under an executive order that would take us to 33%. So today, I am fortunate enough to have a law for 33% and a carb regulation for 33% and the rules are different. Um, we hope that this will be reconciled very soon, but it may take years to get that done. Uh, so I was talking about, what, what, one of the questions I was asked to talk about is what's a fleet going to look like in 2020? And I don't know, but I know that economics plays a huge role. Um, and I can tell you this because uh, this is what our solar portfolio looked like uh, about 18, 19 months ago. And this is what it looks like today. And let me tell you a little bit about the difference. This is solar thermal. And so solar thermal is... Um, you collect the sun's rays, you use uh, a, a parabola of sorts to focus those rays on a fluid. The fluid gets really hot and it goes into a steam turbine. That steam turbine then acts just like any other steam turbine, like a natural gas steam turbine. That's solar thermal. So about two years ago, this is what we predicted our solar thermal out output would be. Uh, that it was hit its historical production through 2009, or excuse me, 2008, and then forecasted production that'd be in our portfolio uh, past that. And the red line is solar thermal, the blue line is solar PV ground mount. You can, you can barely see it, it's at the access. The, the yellow line is solar uh, PV rooftop. And so you can see just in an 18 month period, 
This, by the way, took um, years and decades to kind of build the solar thermal portfolio. And in 18 months, where now solar PV is almost uh, eclipsing the solar thermal. Um, wh why is that? How is it that for um, eight, nine years, we didn't do much uh, photovoltaics, and in 18 months, we've done enough photovoltaics to equal almost the amount that it took us 20 years to build in thermal? The answer is economics. Um, economies of scale, uh, excess inventories, these kind of things have really driven the PV market, the photovoltaic market, to be very cost competitive. Um, how's the grid going to be affected? Um, so my answer to that is a lot. Um, I, technically, uh, there, we kind of break these, uh, how the grid's going to be affected, and when I, we talk about grid, a lot of people think of the, um, just the technical aspect of the grid. But there's really three components of what's going to happen with renewables in my mind. One is technical feasibility. It's fairly straightforward, but there's lots of studies to do. So we have interconnection studies. Every time a plant wants to interconnect to the system, we have to go through safety checks. We have to go through stability studies. We have to go through a bunch of things to figure out how is this electricity going to affect the grid. And we know how to do that. We've been doing that for a while. And we, we, we have requirements on the plants now for telemetry so that we can monitor where, where the plant's uh, electrical generation is in a real-time basis. And we're, we're evolving so that we can remotely dispatch. Um, there's two um, uh, difficulties kind of with uh, the renewable technology, and that is the fact that it's very difficult to store electricity, and it's even much more difficult to store wind and solar. Uh, so you have this fuel source. The fuel is wind and solar, or, and it's very difficult to time when it's going to come and when it's not going to come. So there's a lot of intermittency and, and, and technical issues with the grid, uh, grid stability. Um, but we can handle those. Um, so they're fairly straightforward. The second part is, uh, that's a little bit more complicated is market operations. Um, how do, what do you do with this energy? How do you integrate it? Um, what services do you need? And I'll give you an example. There's going to be a major economic dislocation in the markets. Um, and here's why. You're adding a fuel source that is zero cost. And you have to now back up that fuel source. When a, when a cloud comes over a PV plant, 200 megawatt PV plant, it will shut that PV plant down instantaneously. So what backs it up? A natural gas plant will have to back it up, most likely. And so what ends up happening here is the renewable resources with zero fuel costs drive the energy costs down in the market. The gas plants rely on those energy revenues, but now the energy revenues are going in the tank. And now we're going to be dispatching these power plants in a way that they're not meant to dispatch. We're going to be fluctuating them up and down inversely proportional to the uh, intermittency of the wind and the solar. And so they're going to get cycled a lot more. They're going to get turned on and turned off a lot more. And they're going to run at minimum load a lot more. So you have a gas plant that's out there. Its revenues are going down because the energy market's going down. Its costs are going up because it's being cycled more uh, uh, than it used to be, and it's being run more inefficiently. So we have a major economic dislocation that we have to come up with new products and services to be able to figure out how this gas plant can actually stay whole and not go bankrupt. So th this is a, a something we're tackling. And then who pays for it? That's the most controversial. Um, and, and so we, um, you know, who pays for all the integration? A another example is um, we, we have a lot of balls that are being hidden, and it's about subsidies. Um, there's some major subsidies out there. You don't really know how much you're paying for this stuff. Um, net energy metering is, a, is an example of that. Uh, the city of Austin uh, had some very high penetration with folks putting uh, solar panels on their rooftops. And what, it, what they were ended up doing is the customer could completely offset their entire bill. Your bill is made up of a couple components. About half of Edison's bill is the actual electrons that flow across the wires. About a quarter is um, distribution, so that's the wires that are near your home. And then a little bit less than a quarter is transmission, the large wires. And then the remaining is public, um, public service and public goods charges. So what's happening is people have uh, solar on the roof in their house. They send electrons to the grid during the day because their house is probably using less than their panels are making. And then at night, when the sun's gone, they're pulling electricity off of the grid. 
And so they're sending and pulling. And what's happening is they're entirely offsetting all the components of their bill. The generation component, the distribution component, the transmission component, the public service. They're completely not paying for the wires. And the, the resident next to them who does not have solar, their rates have to go up now to pay for the wires for their neighbor. So this is something that um, the Sacramento is very familiar with. Um, the policymakers in, in San Francisco are very familiar with, but it's something that we've agreed to do for now. And then the reason we want to do it is because we want to promote, promote renewables. But that's where you get into cost allocation as a major problem. Or, sorry, it's very contentious. Uh, what are the challenges with renewables? Uh, permitting, interconnection, financing technology, and PPA, I apologize for not spelling that out. That means purchase power agreement. It's a contract, and that's what my business is. My job is to go out and get contracts from third parties who own and operate uh, uh, renewable power plants. Um, but these, these three things, or excuse me, these um, five things all ebb and flow at various uh, points. Um, and financing has probably been uh, some of the biggest changes recently. Um, but technology, uh, certainly, and commercial feasibility, all of these things are moving all the time. And it kind of gets to the point that when we develop policies, they need to be broad enough to allow things to shift because the market and uh, research and, uh, moves in a pace that I don't think policy can keep up with. Um, so it, it's kind of hard. You want to provide the right incentives. And so uh, dictating something like a 33% standard is good. But if the 33% standard said 8% has to be solar and 2% has to be wind and 4% has to be geothermal, that's not going to work because these things are, are you can't balance um, all these issues at the same time. So um, I don't think I have a, a slide after this. That's it. So I'm sorry we're uh, pretty late, about 15 minutes behind. And Panos, I don't know what you want to do next. Yes, well, f first of all, to thank you. Uh, if there are any questions that uh, want to be put to the members of our panel, please go ahead and do. Uh, So um, I think that regulation, um, you know, plays an integral role. Although it fails, you know, many many times, um, the history of, de of regulation for the electric industry was all about. They were afraid that if they didn't make make it regulated from the public standpoint that industry would not supply power to the poor. Um, the same analogy didn't work with beer and you can go to any you know <laughs> ghetto and get a 44 ouncer for two dollars and fifty cents and no one regulated you need you need to provide you know the, the product to the poor. So regulation has to be very very carefully studied in terms of how you put put it in place and how you you, how you um, deregulate it, and and I think that it's best done like, for example, going to car manufacturers, um, simply asking for a smog certificate. You know, these are things that we we live with. You know, every single day. I would make this projection that would drive them crazy, but if you shut the grid off today in one year, everybody would have electricity, and there would be more efficiency, and there would be great a great system somewhere that would evolve out of that and within five years we would solve you know solve the whole problem but the Toffler said in future shock there's no significant innovation occurs without first a crisis so we sort of we're in crisis mode right now why because we're paying five bucks you know for gas okay now oh, we got to do something about this you know and um, and 
just before this crisis was going to take place, I was going to I was selling my Hummer. I can't sell my Hummer now because it doesn't make financial sense to sell my Hummer because I you know I have to drive it and put more, you know more gas in it. I I only use that tongue in cheek um, to say that regulation. I, I I fear that we don't regulate, and I fear regulation, and that there needs to be a healthy. It's it's like gravity, you know. You have, we all should have a healthy you know, respect for it and a healthy respect, uh, fear of it as well. I, I don't know if that really answers your question. It's sort of. Anyone else? Yes. The, uh, the SEE case, the brilliant solution to, to variability in, in uh, renewables is, of course, uh, the, the use of all these peakers, peaking stations, the, the gas fire. What about storage? What about batteries? What about the emergence of that? Are you? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, we're not a primary research area, but Edison has uh, coming in about a year the largest lithium lithium ion battery in the United States. It's going to be. Um, let me give you a size. The system that we're operating in is 50,000 megawatts. This, the biggest battery in the world that's coming to us is eight megawatts. So there's a little bit of a problem there just to start. Um, but we are looking at all kinds of storage on the back end. So you either store the fuel on the front end or you store the electricity on the back end. Um, because you can't store the fuel in these cases, we have to store the electricity. And so we're looking at uh, lithium ion batteries. We're looking at pumped hydro storage. And this is where you let water out during the day and then you run the motors backwards. You send electricity to the motor and it puts water back up in the hill at night um, and that can there's already a lot of pump storage we've had it for multiple decades um, and that can be in the 200 400 500 megawatt range uh, there's flywheels there's compressed air there's a bunch of different storage um, uh, uh, technologies out there and they're all kind of competing to see which one is going to solve which issue um, and I don't think that one of them is going to be the solution. It's kind of the same answer to is it large scale or small scale? And the answer is yes. Is it going to be batteries, flywheels, compressed air storage, and, or pump storage? The answer is not one. It's yes, all of them. Uh, batteries might help with frequency. Uh, pump storage might help with major ramping. Um, uh, flywheels can help with uh, inertia. Uh, you know, we have all these different problems on the grid and all these different problems without because we can't store the fuel and, we, and we're having a tough time storing electricity, but each of those storage problems can be solved by different to, uh, storage technology. Yes. For you? Yeah. Yeah, this question's for Mark, actually. I um, enjoyed, your, enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. So I'm thinking about putting solar on my house, which I think I'll do now that I'm <laughs> making <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was at a, I was at a club. I was at a, um, a meeting with uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was run by the U.S. Navy, who are very concerned about climate change because of the issues in the Arctic and the security of the Arctic. Um, and there, the, 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 all the DODs were were represented. And it turns out the DODs have a, I guess, it's a mandate to be 50% renewables by 2020. Yep. Which is pretty interesting because it's a challenge, obviously. Your your your, your challenge is 33%. Yeah. But all sorts of technologies. They're considering all sorts of technologies and advancing technologies. So my question basically is, uh, uh, you know, is the private, the private energy sector in, in any way kind of communicating or looking over the shoulder of what's happening within the DOD? Because there you might see the technology being developed. You may see much more efficient solar, right. solar PVs being developed um, because they're going to be putting the dollars in to do this. And, and I think that the impression I got from the discussion was, their 50 their 50 percent renewables isn't because they have a desire to be green that's economics yeah. pure and simple yeah that they need to be they need in order to run the dod in the 2020s the cost of energy is so great that they'll be out of business if they don't do yeah. something about changing the energy profile well that that was not a short question um <laughs> and it was uh, lot, lots of pieces to it uh so let me start backwards because that's the best i can remember um the cost uh, so right now, uh, I am actually buying solar PV plants about the same cost of gas plants. And, and what you might say is, um, uh, wow, we have grid parity now. Uh, renewables are as cheap as, as uh, fossil fire generation. And um, I would challenge that because the gas plants don't have a 30% uh, tax subsidy. 
Um, so actually they're not, it's one of the balls that's being hidden. Um, so whether uh, renewables will be cheaper, this is the, the beauty. If renewables, uh, their capital costs are very high. In fact, so high that they offset the fact that the fuel source is free. If you get to a point where renewables become cheap enough, you don't need a 33% standard. You don't need to tell the utility to buy anything. We're gonna buy it because it's the cheapest to do. Um, so that's the beauty of it. So if, if, the, if the Department of Defense has a view that uh, renewables are gonna be cheaper and they're doing procurement and doing uh, investments today, that's actually gonna benefit the rest of us because uh, the larger scales, of the, the bigger economies, that production, they have this experience curve in manufacturing. So the first time you build something, you know you just, it's not the best one you can do. But as you get more and more experience, you get uh, more efficient at what you're doing. And so it's, it's kind of good to have uh, the Department of Defense leading the way. Um, th another question is, can the grid get to 100% renewables? And we have had uh, some uh, folks internally have been very, I guess, upset. I'll give you an example. Uh, Marin Energy Authority in Marin County has decided that they're going to go 100% renewables. This is not a very large uh, uh, set of customers and they're inside the um, uh, California electric grid. And so they tell their customers, we are providing all of our electrons we're providing to you are 100% green. And that's just a, a false statement because the only reason they can provide 100% green is because they have gas plants that are backing these renewables up. Similarly with the Department of Defense, they can probably try to go to 50%, but they're gonna need the grid, someone else's grid behind it to back it up. And uh, right now we serve a lot of the bases in California and we have redundant services and we've been working with them quite a bit to try to help them improve their uh, green attributes. Um, but I think there is a, a big uh, element of economics embedded in it. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, uh, one of the most interesting aspects of your chart which showed um, you know, the climbing renewable was the flatlining of the PV rooftop. Um, as an owner, I got, my utility gave me $200 last month, which was fantastic for my solar. Um, but I guess I just really want to know from your perspective and from the other panelists as well, what do you see as the biggest roadblock right now for transforming that line from flatline to skyrocket? Um, it, to me, probably the biggest uh, roadblock is the ebbs and flows of uh, f uh, federal and state uh, policy on incentives. Uh, and right now there's four major incentives uh, for putting uh, renewables on. Um, two of them have been around for multiple decades and two of them are uh, recession based. Uh, one is a production tax credit, and that's the more you produce, the more tax credits we give you. Another is an investment tax credit. Those are both things that have been around for multiple years, um, but uh, they have changed kind of the level of the credit and when the credit expires multiple times. Um, and the second uh, two that are recession-based is a cash grant well, where instead of the uh, Treasury giving you tax credits over a 10-year period, they actually give you the equivalent of a tax credit over 10 years in one lump sum. Here's your check. There you go. That was put in place a year ago, and it expires next year. So what ends up happening is there's a mad rush to get the cash grant. And you have to be, to be eligible, you have to turn dirt or install uh, this year, and by uh, for wind, you actually have to be generating next year, and for solar, uh, it's 2016. And multiple times, we've come right up to where that's going to expire, mad rush, and then government extends the subsidy. And so there's these bones and busts, and it, it's the same in um, the residential level, too. We have funds. We will subsidize. We'll give you a rebate. And oh, by the way, that rebate's gone. And so you see even small uh, residential uh, panel installers, you'll see a boon and bust in there, the, the amount of folks that are in that too. And so what my, my personal opinion, not Edison's, is we need a multi-decade uh, plan on how we're gonna subsidize these if we are. And my hope is that the subsidies eventually go away so that we're not hiding the ball, um, so that they degrade over time. 
The problem with that, I'd love to say how easy it is to do that. It's not because the changes in technology, the commercial feasibility of each of these different technologies, you might need a subsidy for wind longer than you need one for solar. Or maybe you don't need a, a subsidy for either one of those, but you need one for tidal waves. So it's, it's very difficult. It's easy for me to say we need a multi-decade policy. It's very difficult to put it in place. But that's been probably in the last two years the biggest kind of hurdle is we're rushing to get something built because it's the tax credits are going to expire. If I might add, um, well, I think the biggest in, uh, problem that we have is we're asleep. And we, and we sort of doze off and then we wake up and we go, oh, we need to do something about this. But we don't, we, we, we don't if, if, if America or humans would get, you know, wake up and realize we can do something about this, we can make it better, we can, do, you know, we can get rid of, I'm sorry about this, the ugly wires that run across, you know, yeah, our, our landscape and sorry. all the, yeah, all the, you know, all, all those things. But um, w one of the things that I would say would be the quickest is if we had a pool of, of funds that was made available to small business and, you know, large business to be available to build something. So you, you put a project in front of them and you say, I want to build this, and then the funds are available and you pay it back over a period of time. Then that takes out all of those subsidy you know, fluctuations that, that take place that he's talking about. Maybe geothermal takes longer or you know, less time or you know, whatever, whatever those are. Because that then sparks the innovation that somebody says, man, I, could, I, I got an idea and you know, if I put that idea in, in front of someone. Now, we know that we've affected the, the, the poorest nations of the world with microfinance. And the way microfinance works, and everybody's you know, somewhat familiar with this, is that you know, someone says, I'll lend you $1,000, and then somebody goes and buys a goat or some chickens, and then they start populating, you know, and, and pretty soon that whole village begins to you know, rise in its economic development. Well, the same applies if we would do that um, economically, may, instead of using the subsidies, because people steal the subsidies. They, you know, they, 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 and they hide the ball, and, and it's not fair. And we're asking the public utilities to operate with a really un, unfair, you know, set of, uh, set of rules. And then there's guys like me that, you know, get the subsidy and take it and run with it, you know? So I, I, I'm, I'm very critical of the subsidy element. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Um, actually, I had a two-part question. One is pretty simple. Um, you alluded, um, Steve, earlier to nuclear energy. Uh, you made the comment after the unfortunate uh, situation in Japan. Do, you, do you, any of you see nuclear energy becoming you know, um, a viable alternative here in the United States after that incident, similar to what's occurred, for instance, in Europe with France, where they d derived well over 80 percent of their energy from nuclear. And then the other observation, and maybe it's an analogy that's going on in the information technology space, is clearly there's been a huge growth in cloud computing over the last couple of years, which really gets to um, the maybe an alternative model of distribution is that what is really happening is you're getting a huge consolidation of data centers. Um, so that you can drive energy efficiency into those data centers and then rely on the network to go ahead and get that um, information computing power, if you will, down to the individual companies or to, the, uh, or to actual individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you could comment on, um, from any of you on those two uh, different aspects. The, the first, the, go, go back. The power. Oh, the nuclear power, yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's really practical. They came out the other day and said it's going to take them three years to contain it. You know, it's like, oh, you just wrecked a huge mass of land and every, everything around it and, and the economics. I mean, who's going to want to go to Japan, you know, and, and be a tourist or do, you know, do anything? Um, I think that's just practical, uh, you know, from that standpoint. I don't, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I, I don't really know uh, what the impact will be. It, it seems that um, it, it'll be much more difficult, as Steve had said, to build any new nuclear. Um, I don't know if that means that society wants to shut down all the existing nuclear. Um, that would be um, a proposition that probably people don't 
grasp the impacts of on the cost basis, I'm sure. And the second part to your question? The second part was really the analogy of what's happening in your field here. Oh. Yeah. With uh, what's going on in the information technology space. Yeah. I, but, but think about the network. It's different than, it, it's, 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 it's different in cloud computing, because I, I service that, that side of the business. I, I, we put data centers in uh, and um, s service them from the power side. Um, it's the access and the difficulty of the access. You can get you can get access, pre, you know, pretty much, and, and wireless has really improved that. I mean, if we could have wireless power, you know, that would just be utopia, right? <laughs> you, you could just, you know, wire, you know, beam it in. Um, but we don't have that capability, and we we don't have the the, the fluctuations in the net in, in the network. Um, in the cloud computing. So I, I don't know that there are parallel analogy. But as far as getting scale, I, mean, I think that your comments around distribution, as far as my sense was that things would be more spread out. If you look at a lot of what's going on right now, it sounds like without the subsidies, a lot of these alternatives would fail. But if you get enough maps together, then you have the economic scale mm -hmm. to actually be able to go after some of these persons every once in a while. Well, and if you're independent, you don't have the possibility of rolling blackouts and some of the problems that the cascading effect of, 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 of a problem in one area or a terrorist attack or something like that. People are fairly, you know, um, independent in, in a distributed generation model. It's, look, it's long term. We were talking about it yesterday. It's a 30, 30 year, you know, dream. But look, if, you know, if you sell stuff to people and you invent stuff and you put stuff in, 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 in place, you know, there's a business right now in beginning that process, right now. Well, we'd like to thank you very much all. We now have a small coffee break and we'll come back for the thank second round. Thank you, thank again. you all. We'll take a 10 minute uh, break. We'll try to catch up a little bit.